for coming out on this Saturday afternoon. We really do appreciate it. We wanted to have this opportunity to bring you together because I know people have a lot of interest in Marley and if you have read her book or listened to her talk, she talks about the Grassroots Community Foundation, she talks about Super Camp, and the, soup, the book is dedicated to super girls everywhere. So that gives you an opportunity, this is the first opportunity ever for Marley and some of the super girls to be together. So this is a unique opportunity. I love the city of Philadelphia. I had the pleasure of going to Temple University. I have my doctorate in scholarship. <laughs> um, and this is also the birthplace of um, where I often say I discovered who I became. Um, I used to live at 19th and Green, and in the art museum with a community of people who were there, grassroots was really the beginning um, in its pregnancy in many respects, and it became life in New Jersey. And our very first program from the Grassroots Community Foundation began here in Philadelphia in Frankfurt um, at Harding Middle School and has now expanded to our work in Germantown. So I'm gonna take a few minutes, tell you a little bit about me and tell you a little bit about the Grassroots Community Foundation and kind of introduce you to the people around the room before I introduce our panel. So I am, as I said before, I have a PhD in sociology from Temple University and I am currently an associate professor of sociology and criminal justice at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. In 2010, um, I had the honor of working with Dr. Melody Goodman, who's now at NYU, and a host of scholars about, and we put together a convening around black girl, the future of black girls. And we posed the question, what is the future for black girls, especially around their physical health, mental health, and their criminal justice involvement? And that work had, um, we had the honor of being recognized by Congressman Israel for that work and being awarded a small congressional honor for it. Simultaneously, the then First Lady, the First Lady many of you recognize, Michelle Obama, um, had launched the Let's Move initiative. And that initiative was really focused on ending childhood obesity as we know it. As many of you may know, we have a growing pandemic in the United States and that lives in the bodies of young black women as well as black women across the globe. We also have issues of real economic insecurity. And so the First Lady launched this powerful initiative to address childhood obesity, but didn't really name what was happening um, with our communities. Communities that have had historically been underrepresented and um, communities that really were filled with black women to hold it together. And so for those of us in academia, we thought, how could we help really advance the issues that we know are central in our community? What could we do? And we chose to decide to bring together our collective energy to see if we could in fact bolster community organizations that are often the ones trying to fix the problems. So we know in our communities we have a lot of social service agencies, but many of them do not understand the science of what is happening. How do you in fact address poverty? How do you address health issues, right? So so many people are doing a lot of work and there are a lot of unintended consequences for their action. So as academics, we thought that we should be the kind of people who dealt with the things that Michelle Obama couldn't deal with. She was the first lady of the entire United States, but we were black and brown folks who understood what was going on in our community. And together, 17 of us got together and we were business people, we were photographers, we were social scientists, we were people who had enough resources to help our community and we needed a place to galvanize. And that place of coming together is really the birthplace of the Grassroots Community Foundation. So we essentially took all the things that the First Lady could not and did not consider and we put them together. So the focus of our organization is to attend to young women and older women around the issues of their health and in intersecting and overlapping way. Their physical health, their mental health, their sexual health, and the economics of health. And we develop programs that are informed by social science research, but really meets people where they are. Not in some random place, but we do work in the community with the collaboration of the community. And in 2011, we decided that we were gonna 
do something that we knew worked, especially for our community. We were gonna have a party, and we call that party Let's Move It. So the First Lady's initiative was Let's Move. We decided that we needed to move something. And with the help of a Tariq Black Thought Trotter from The Roots, the Let's Move It party began. And we raised funds, the party was then at the Blockley, right, Ch Chestnut, 34th and Chestnut, and we raised funds and gave those funds to a community organization with our support in order to implement the work. And that work has now grown, we're now in our eighth year, and we've been doing work primarily in zip codes that had high levels of poverty, high levels of crime, and lots of us, black and brown folks. And we have grown. Three years ago, and Super Camp started simultaneously, but not within the foundation. Super Camp, the work that Marley comes out of, started analogously, right? So as we were building the foundation, we at first thought we needed to really focus on these community-based organizations. And with the help and the push of some of our members you're about to meet, the idea was like, well, what are we gonna do for the next generation? And what could we do? So. I have been an educator my whole life. I was a high school teacher, I'm a college professor. We started Super Camp with five girls in my living room. And the idea was to essentially teach them these things that I knew that were important for health and well-being. That if they understood who they were, if they understood the importance of being literate, if they moved, if they could learn to see the world through different lenses, that would happen. And the first year was really quite fantastic. You're gonna meet three of the girls from the first five years um, today. And over time, they merged. And when the work merged, the work of Super Camp and the work of the Grassroots Community Foundation, we really were able to find our rhythm. We decided, and through our learning, was that if we wanted to change the world, we needed to develop change makers, a new generation of change makers that understood what Martin and Malcolm, a Sojourner and Harriet, all of these different movements knew, but we would in fact take the contemporary lens of these young people and teach them how they could do it. And as with everything we do, we do it by team. And the product are some of these girls that you see today, but it has been 45 girls over time, and now Marley stands as a kind of example of what is possible when we do make the effort to invest in girls. So I'm really thankful for you for being here today because you will get some insight into how this process happens. Now we are expanding to the city of Philadelphia and the work is hard um, because it requires a collective energy and a collective investment and investments have ebbs and flows and it means sticking to it. And so we're gonna talk a little bit today about how that happens and I'm gonna encourage you as we start, we're gonna start with 10 girls in the city of Philadelphia. The camp is gonna take place at LaSalle University and it will be over the summer. So it is from July until August and there will be the camp in New Jersey. And we're looking for people who are ready to help us develop this cadre of girl change makers who can make a difference in the world. There should be no reason why there's one Marley. We already know among grassroots that there's more than her. So now we need to kind of reveal ourselves to the world. So I'm here as the president and the person who thought of this crazy idea, but I could not have done it by myself. So there are a few key people in the room that you should meet. And I'd like to introduce you to Dr. I call her Dr. Lisa. Me That's, this is Lisa Maxwell, MBA. She is, she sits on the board of grassroots. And we, in many ways, we owe her for Super Camp because she was insistent. She was one of the people who insisted that it had to happen. Um, and she has devoted her energy to making sure it happens. She's also responsible for raising the money so we can give away a lot of aid um, for Super Camp. I know you'll see the tuition and be like, how am I going to pay that? Lisa <laughs> is responsible for making sure that we raise enough money. Then there is Ali Scott. Part of the Grassroots family is Tanisha Malcolm. And Sonia Fergus, who this, she considers herself the 23rd Supergirl. <laughs> and then we have met some of our members from our Roots Rock Run team. So I have spoken enough. I want to introduce you now to the panel of Supergirls. 
Um, so Marley is a pro at having to take lots of questions, but now we're gonna have the rest of the girls take their hand at it. Uh, and the upside you should know is that we do not believe in prepping our girls in the way that a lot of people are prepped for live audiences. We want you to reimagine what we know about young black girls and about their possibilities. This camp is made up of ordinary girls. I was born poor. The reason, one of the reasons I don't usually talk is because my narrative is very different from Marley's. Marley's grown up with two parents in a nice house with a mom with a PhD. That is not my narrative. Right? So the girls who come into our programs, they are regular girls whose brilliance lives within them and it is our job to activate and support them. So, this is Ariane Went. <laughs> we all know Marley. <laughs> this is Tori Fergus. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Amina and Neckway. So these three girls at the end have been a part of Super Camp since they were five, right? Marley is now 13, Tori is now 14. <laughs> the littlest is the oldest. <laughs> and Amina is 13. And Ariane, this is your fourth year as a part of Super Camp. So I'm gonna ask them a few general questions. I don't know what their answers will be. We'll all be surprised. And then I'm gonna ask them some specific questions because I think that if you, I was in the audience, I would wanna know. So we're gonna begin with Ariane. So Ariane, when you first started Super Camp, how did it feel? So when I first started Super Camp, it felt, I felt nervous because I didn't know any of the girls and I was shy because I didn't know what anybody would expect of me and like my reactions and things like that. So once I got to know the girls, I felt comfortable around them and I can talk to them, I can share my feelings and yeah. Okay, all right. What about you, Amina? When you first started Super Camp, way in the dark ages. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so when I first started Super Camp, it was really early and I like just met Marley and her family because they were new to the school and I remember I showed her a tour around the school when she already basically knew around the school, but I wanted to do it anyway. <laughs> And like I just came to her birthday party and I basically knew most of the girls. I was a little bit nervous because I felt like everyone already knew each other from preschool and I, they already had a bond and I wanted to fit in. But it was really easy and it was really comfortable and it was fun because we got to ride in Miss Janice's truck all the time. <laughs> I'll tour, you can use her. her mic. What was it like for you, Tori? <laughs> Um, when I first started Super Camp, well, it was in Miss Janice, well, Dr. Janice's living room, and I felt very comfortable because I knew most of the girls, like Amina said, but at the same time, it wasn't your ordinary camp. Like, I've been to camp in my town, and it was basically just so that kids would be occupied while their parents were at work, but with this, five-year-olds were using computers and learning how to do, like, multiplication and we were also taking we were also learning civil leadership and at at a young age i didn't really understand that my what i was learning was much higher than the people at school but when i did understand that i was able to share that with the people at school that there's a whole nother world out there there is there's egypt used to be called kemet there's there was slavery there was, but at the same time there wasn't just slavery before that there was kings and queens with opportunities So Riley, how did it feel having four additional girls in your house for camp? I mean, it was great. I had a great time because I'm an, I'm an only child, so I spend, you know, some time with my friends, but getting to be with them and also getting to learn with them was fun because we were just in my family room when, when we had, like, literally nothing to do. We were, uh, normally in the summer, I'd have, like, nothing to do. I'd just be sitting there sleeping all day, which is fun, but it's not as fun as being with my friends. So we were able to, you know, learn about writing and be able to do yoga and then perform in front of each other. And it kind of taught me to be a leader in situations where I had the most um, expertise. And it taught me to not always be like, well, I'm the person who's confident, so I have, always have to overstep everybody. And it taught me to kind of, you know, just let them all enjoy their passions and all their talents and their gifts. 
And it was a really fun experience, and it's still really fun today to watch newer girls, even though Ariana's been here for four years, girls who are younger than her, um, to grow and to see that same thing where they have to step back and let other girls show who they fully are and their fullest potential. Okay. Now, Tori, what have you most learned about yourself being in super camp? Well, in the beginning of super camp, I didn't like people. <laughs> I wouldn't hug people or even look them in the eyes. So I learned that maybe that I was there was some confidence inside of me. And with these girls, Marlene Amina and Arian, who made me comfortable, I realized that I can talk to people. I am really smart. I'm really beautiful. And yeah. yes. What about you, Arian? What have you learned about yourself? Well, um, I learned that um, well before I wasn't like shy, shy, but. I was shy, I didn't like speaking in public, I didn't like talking to people I didn't know, but then I kind of like build my confidence and now like today I'm speaking in front of you guys and now I feel comfortable with my sisters as I would call them because they're like family, so yeah. And you Amina? I've learned a lot. <laughs> um, mostly I've learned that I love to avoid confrontation, like confrontation has just always not been my forte. But I've also learned that um, I love to perform and that performing is a way for me to be confident and be able to um, show my feelings or my emotions through my acting or dancing or just learning to express my feelings has really been a major thing that I've learned, learning that I don't like mom, I don't like these shoes because they don't fit or they're not my style. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, these these are, they're fine. <laughs> but like just being able to say like that that I don't like this outfit or it's not my style was really a struggle for me. Just being able to express my feelings and learn more about myself has really been a major lesson from grassroots. So one of the one of the recurring themes that I hear about Super Camp, and I don't think that it started this way, is the confidence that you gain after being a part of this experience. So Marley, you talk a lot about confidence. Um, how do you think Super Camp helps a girl discover her confidence or become confident? Uh, I think one of the biggest tools is the principles of Ma'at. So um, camp can range between, I think it's four weeks this year, but it's been four to five weeks. And we focus on truth, order, balance, reciprocity. Um, four out of the 62 or 72 principles of Ma'at, which is the belief in ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt and what they practice. So I think that through the principles and learning truth that you need to live with, your, uh, live with who you are and embrace the things that, that you know. Because I was always a fairly bright kid and I knew a lot of stuff, but I never wanted to tell people that I was smart. I just wanted to lay back in the corner, do what I had to do, and not actually share what I was really good at. And I think through truth, I learned that I need to share my resources in ways that I wasn't doing before. And with order, I feel like we could all say that we were very messy, or we weren't organized at all. We thought we were just going to get it done, that it's over, and we're, whatever happens in the in-between doesn't matter. But we learned to slow down our processes and to also break down everything that we do and explain why we feel this way, why we're connected to this, why we care about this, why we focus on this. And it was really important to me and also important to learn that about my friends and how I can assist them. And with balance, it was, it's now really important to me. Uh, having to be on a book tour and having to be a student and that I have an environmental assembly I have to perform at in a couple of days. I'm not very excited, but I have to keep working. So I learned how to use my passions, things that I enjoy, and reading and also talking and integrate that into the things that I struggle to do. And the most important one for me is reciprocity and being able to give back to other people. I'm learning that those who come before me, whether I know them or not, they're biological or not, are important to the future and important to the success of me right now. Now, Mina, of all the principles, which one would you say that you most, you've made the most progress on? Definitely truth. Yeah, I'd say truth. Truth with myself, truth with others. Truth, just in general, was a hard topic for me because I don't think I was being honest with myself or others, and that caused a serious rift. And I also, I also lied to people a lot, like saying, 
like before how I said I liked this when maybe I didn't like it and I didn't I wasn't able to really feel my true emotions and know how I truly felt so being able to be honest with myself and then be honest with others really was a big major step that I had to take and as I got better it was easier for me to express my feelings and say I'm not really feeling this but I like this and just like just really expressing myself was a major thing that I've learned from truth and I've grown from truth. What about you, Ariane? Um, well, um, I think reciprocity really helped because like me and my mom and my dad, we would go out and we would feed food to the homeless, but that's all really what we did. But with grassroots and with the Supergirls, we really, we went to Georgia King Village and we help the community, so. What about you, Tor? I think mine would be order because I'm not, I'm not actually really an organized person. <laughs> and I per sometimes I procrastinate a lot or I don't actually prepare for things, but Ms. Janice has, Dr. Janice, I'm sorry, has us make a list of the things. And even Marley, when she was like six years old, she had a list when I, like she would wake up in the morning and she would do this and it would be right in front of her bed. So I learned that I could create lists and, and yeah, I could use order in my everyday life to become more prepared and organized. Right. Well, thank you guys. So I, my final question before I, I leave it to the audience is, you all are in spaces where you see other black girls and you see other black people, right? How is your experience with Grassroots and through Super Camp, how does that distinguish you from the other girls in your community that you see? What do you notice about yourself and Super Girls that are a lot, that are different from what you notice from other girls? What about you? I could say for myself that a lot of the times in social studies class, and I feel like every black girl's ever experienced this, where there's either just in class generally an over-sexualization of black girls or there are falsehoods about the experiences of black girls. So for example, like we were talking about slavery and the enslavement of Africans and um, it's just like simple conversations where my teacher messes up and says that Africa's a country or they do things that are just like slowly microaggressions towards saying that black people are not valid or that their stories are not being told correctly or that they are savagers or that they're not fully people. And even though um, I had a black social studies teacher a couple years, uh, a year ago, he made us um, separate into two separate groups and Amina was in my class and made a, a one side fight to say that slavery was important and another side fight to say that slavery was bad. And it was supposed to be you know, a historical model, but to the black girls that were on the side saying that slavery was good, how do you think that makes them feel? So I feel like I was able to gain the tools to show that that is really problematic and that that can't happen in other classes because it sends a message to black girls and sends a message to other kids that we are not to be valued in the same way. So I feel like I already show an outspokenness that has um, been given to me through the process of being in super camp and also shows me to find the truths and to share those truths with others. Sonia, the history teacher, so that's really me. <laughs> what about you, Aram? Well, um, I think that, like Marley said, um, we don't really talk about slavery in school, and um, it kind of makes all the black kids in our class feel like they're in a like a bubble, like nobody really recognizes them, and they feel like they're left out when they're when all the other white kids they they don't really talk about slavery, or our teacher messes up with. Um, like slavery is a good thing or it's a bad thing and all the presidents had slavery, uh, slaves and things like that. So I, I feel the same way and I try to address my teacher in some ways so we can talk about how we can probably, in our social studies class, we can probably fix like a lesson where we can learn about slavery and then everybody knows like what's happening. Uh -huh. What about you, Tor? Um, I feel the same way as Marley and Arion because in school, even we have like a small bit just on the Civil War, and that's as much as you're going to get about black history. But then at the same time, I'm not saying that the Holocaust is a bad thing, but we learn about that, and we learn more than about that than black history, but people still complain about it. 
And then when we do talk about this stuff, I feel like I'm always being looked at, but I, by kids, whenever someone says, oh, slavery this, they look at you as if you should be ashamed of your history, but I know that I should be proud of my history. And also at the same time, I feel girls that don't have this program, well, some of them, because of this, they think that, oh, because my hair is not straight, I'm not pretty, so they have to straighten their hair because they think that's what they need to be accepted. And they don't. <laughs> okay, I agree with every, what everyone has said at the table. I think with grassroots, we're more aware of our history and able to see these little microaggressions, as Marley said, and be able to recognize them and speak out about it. Because sometimes, like what my history teacher said to me like a few weeks ago about like wearing um, a rope around your neck for a mirror like cattle, like those little things that irk you and they make you uncomfortable. And usually, if you didn't know about grassroots, you just let it sink in and you wouldn't be able to say anything about it or know how to process that or if I should tell somebody about it, should we talk about it, like what's the right, like, what does Ms. Janice always say? What's course the right of course of action? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's the right course of action to take? But with grassroots, we're more aware and we're like, well, this isn't okay that we're talking about this event more than this event and that when we're talking about our history, we should be ashamed or we should feel more upset about it rather than other people when it's all of our history and we all should be aware of what's happening. So you should know that we learn a lot of black, we learn a lot of African and African American history at Super Camp. Um, and it's important that we learn it in ways that are not typically taught in schools, in, a, in ways that centers the black experience as an important part of history, that we begin with the continent of Africa where all life begins and that we work our way through it so that they can have this complex understanding of what has really happened in the world. Now, the responsibilities of the school system, especially if it's a public school system, are different. And therefore, in many respects, it is not our charge to kind of engage in that. But what we want to make sure is that when we have in each week, right, so the week around truth, is that we have an establishment of the facts. And that's the facts around your history, the facts around beauty, the facts around our health, right, so that they have true information that they can process. Now, Tori, I think, touched on an important point about black beauty, right? So we say at Grassroots, which is every person that exists is of value and has something to contribute. And each person in their natural way, unbothered, untampered with, is beautiful. And so we do not, Marley used to say that I engage in preventative parenting. We're not defensive about the experiences that have happened. We understand them. These are the truth of who, what they are. And so when people combat us, we can respond with the truth, right? So it, it is not true that the enslavement of African experience was the fault of the African. It is just not true. And so one can then really say that to a, an, um, to a faculty member or a teacher. You don't have to feel like you don't know what to say. You have a course of action um, that is possible. And we want to make sure that our young people are change makers. Now, I don't know if we have a little bit of time. It does seem that we have a little bit of time. Marley said to me several weeks ago um, when we were out on the tour, she said, if it wasn't me, it was going to be somebody else. And so I thought maybe we should take a minute to answer why you said that. Why did you think that if it wasn't you that was now writing the book, why did you think it could be? Some other supergirl. Okay, so to begin, you told me my answer should be pithy or yes. fancy or whatever. So you can take a long so time with this one. I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna be quick though. So I think when I said that, mom was asking me about like the campaign and the book and all the things that have been happening that I'm really, really grateful for. And I said it I said because I feel like there's a power that is in all of us, that is unique to each every one of us. Ariana is a fantastic athlete. She is so, so graceful. 
Tori is just Google. We call Tori Google, and that's why we never give Tori water. We never splash any water near her. She never swims because we don't want to break Google. And Amina is a fantastic performer and a singer and a dancer and an actress. And you can all, I know you're in Philly, but you can all go check her Instagram out and see the link to her plays that she's in and to support her. So I think that there's a, an individual talent and an individual passion in each and every one of these girls that has been unlocked by you and by Miss Lisa and by Miss Ali and by Miss Tanisha and by Miss Sonia and Miss Patrice, who didn't get her a fair oh, no, shout out, but Miss Patrice. Her. I was like, did she leave? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I feel like there was something that I experienced because I live with you and it was able to happen because I had already known what I cared about when I started camp but there's something that is happening with the new generation of super campers uh, and super girls where they're able to see that they have something inside of them. And even if they're just the teacher's daughter or the mailman's daughter or the sales rep's daughter, that they can be in the middle and reach the top at levels that they didn't think they could. So, grassroots um, is divided into these four divisions. So we have Leaves girls who are elementary school age girls and we have uh, seedlings who are elementary school age girls, leaves that are middle schoolers, um, five to eighth grade, and then we have branches, our high schoolers, and then roots are caregivers. And when a girl becomes a leaf, she has to design a social action project. So the 1,000 Black Girl Books um, campaign really comes out of that development of the social action project. They must find a thing that they think is a social issue Right, and by social means in their school, their community, or in the world that they want to attend to, but they must use their passions and their talents. And the reason that's important is because so much of the people who we now loud for making changes in the world, we're giving them praises, have money. And we have forgotten that we are a resource in and of ourselves. The talents, the things that we are born with, the things that we learn, the skills that we acquire, they can be the things that make a difference. And we can do that if we work together and galvanize with our community. So Marley's project you are not all familiar with, but I thought maybe we could take a moment. Ariane is up next. Um, so we'll start with Amina to tell you a little bit about their project so you can understand that girls who are part of this process for us will have to unlock their passion and use that passion to make an impact. So you can tell them what your project was and right. why you wanted to do it. So my project was Math with Games, hashtag Math with Games, and it was about math confidence. I always felt like I was really good at math, and I was really good in sixth grade math, but then I didn't get into honors the next year, so I felt like a loss of my math confidence until I've recently gained it back from like seventh to eighth grade year. And I felt like a lot of black girls must be struggling with this, and girls in general must be struggling with math confidence and feeling like they're able to be competent and amazing at math and not feel like they have to be constricted or can't be too good at math because they don't want to be a brainiac or anything like that or nerd but like that math can be a fun topic and that math is a topic that they can pursue so that was my topic and this was really important because you all know what's happening across the globe is that stem research and the kind of push out of women and girls in terms of math and science and so Amina held these games and the girls had girls as well as one boy had a <laughs> chance to compete in a series of games and the winner was a four-year-old girl. Wow. She beat all these people out, and she won at the game Jenga. So Jenga is a real strategic game of math positioning. She was four. I, it's so tragic to say that. Nina, how old is Nina? She was, no, she's not. How old was she? Nina. Nina. She was four? She was five. Wow. She was five. She oh, was five yeah, I was seven. like, wait. She was five years old, and she beat out all these old kids at <laughs> five, 13. Um, to win, and it really gave her a tremendous amount of confidence in going into mathematics the following year. So we really want to be able to kind of address these kinds of larger social issues through this very, very specific um, kind of use of talents. Designed by girls, developed by girls, and executed with their own skills. What about you, Tori? <laughs> um, my social action project was called hashtag full court dress. I don't have Instagram, so I'm sorry if that's wrong. <laughs> but um, basically, my mom's a high school teacher in the city of Newark, and 
and it's a city which is one of the biggest like cities in the state of New Jersey, but a lot of people look down on it. Like when I was in fifth grade, a boy even wrote, we had to write a narrative, and he said, my trip to Newark and how I was afraid of that. And, but people don't realize that, as Miss Janice says, if there are issues in the world, we're supposed to help them. We're not just supposed to look down on them. And since my mom is a teacher, even when I was young, she's been a teacher for like 20 years or so, and she's always told me that her students have to walk miles to school. So I just imagined that in the winter they must be really cold. So I decided that I wanted to take two passions that I have, helping people and doing basketball, which even though I'm not that tall, I still enjoy. So I was hoping that with the basketball game, I'd be able to raise coats and scarves and stuff so that people could be warm while walking to school. And she was able to raise over a thousand coats and we were able to give them to young people. Now one of the things that we discovered in the process is that when we have these coat drives in the winter, they're often for adults. Um, and socks is not usually given and it is the most under given gift in terms of helping to support families who are residentially insecure and young people are getting coats. So we tend to give adult coats because it's adults given and they just want to give a coat that they no longer need but we don't think about the very young people who need coats. So Tori's drive was really able to do that and we were able to give to four different communities that needed coats for young people who are residentially insecure. Now Ariane is up next and she's at the very beginning of her project, but I want to kind of help Ariane through. This is gonna be her first public description of her project. So I want you to tell them, Ariane, a little bit about your health. What are some of the health issues that you live with? Okay. Um, so I have arthritis. Can you hear Ariane? Mm -hmm. this okay. One, it on. okay, it was on, okay. Um, I have juvenile arthritis, which is a joint disorder and um, it causes swelling and um, like it affects the body and sometimes you can't move, you can't stretch and it, it's really painful. Um, but for my case, I'm not major. Um, when I go to the hospital, I see kids who have their feet in different directions and I know sometimes they have to sit in wheelchairs. But for me, it's more like of minor, so I'm I still feel pain, but I'm not so, I'm still flexible. I can move and everything. Um, so tell us what a typical hospital visit is like for you. Um, well, my hospital visit, the nurses are nice, but sometimes it's unexpected when I'm going to get a shot or a needle, and it's very painful. Even though they provide things that might help, it still hurts. and. Sometimes I feel nervous or scared, and I just don't like the feeling. And um, do you see, now you've had some chance to kind of learn about this arthritis, and there are other diseases that are similar like arthritis that you, you learned about. Um, those things are asthma, and I believe it's called immunotherapy. <laughs> immunotherapy. Immunotherapy. <laughs> um, and um, I know some of the people on the panel have asthma, and um, it's uh, where your lungs, where the mucus gets caught up in your lungs and you can't breathe when you run or when you do an activity. And immunotherapy is like a big cancer cell that can't beat your regular cell, and sometimes the cancer gets too big and your regular cell like kind of like wears off and it's not there anymore so you just have the cancer just like stuck in your body and what kind what population of people usually have to boys or girls or women who oh. usually has to go through this so i was doing some research and mostly um it's common in girls because girls are more active and they grow faster than boys do um and it's mostly um it's I believe it's 5% of African American children and adults have arthritis, and it's mostly Caucasian people who have um, arthritis. Okay. That's a big population. Okay, so tell us what is your talent and your passion? Um, well, my passion is to share that not um, kids don't, 
kids also have arthritis. It's not just adults because people think that, oh, arthritis is mostly common in older folks because their knees and their elbows and, <laughs> and their ankles <laughs> and all those things. But really, kids also have it too. It's kind of like a, they call it the invisible disease because you can't, re you can't really see it, but it's still inside of you. Um, and I just want to share that kids also feel pain and that they also need comfort and they also need to feel that they're loved and they need care. So what are you proposing to do for your social action project? So my social action project is called the Zen Zone where kids can feel freely to be comfortable mm -hmm. and where you, they would schedule um, injections or if you need to get a shot, you can. You don't have to be nervous or scared. You can feel comfortable. So, like for example, it would be a station where you can have an iPad. You can talk to friends, and you can have like those one of those beanie bag chairs where you can just like sit in and squat and do whatever you want to do, um, and you can just feel loved, like I said. Our work is really about unlocking kids' passion and making it known to the world because the examples that we have currently about black girls, about black people, is one-sided and often myopic. And so we want to extend everybody's view of what is possible. And this is what's really possible. Marley is one example of what's possible, but through the development of Supercamp and the community, there are more things that are possible with our girls. We can make a difference with this kind of investment. So my portion is up, you all get to ask them questions, and you can also ask the parents and the caregivers. Uh, that's Dr. Patrice Barnett, that's sitting there, part of our community. <laughs> <laughs> She's a legal drug pusher for all of you. Um, so if you have any questions for them, please go ahead. This is Ariane. That's Tori, that's Amina. You can address your questions directly to them and or to all Marley. of them. We skip Marley. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll open it up to questions. Who has a question? You don't have to be shy. I know you didn't go to super camp, but you don't have to be shy. Go right ahead. Hi. Please stand up, tell yep. us who you are. So my name is Maureen Marson. I'm like ready to cry because you guys are awesome. Um, I'm a high school English teacher and I just wanted to ask, you guys are, ladies are brave now and amazing, but that first, you know, like someone said, hey, would you try this? Can you talk about, because I'm going to bring this to my school like Monday, um, can you talk a little bit about how you felt that first step like, and, and how did you did your passion, was it just there all the time or did you have to like reflect and who knows, possibly, I don't know, I would pray or something to figure out where, <laughs> what direction you were going. And then, you know, how did that feel to, because to, to, what you're doing takes courage. And I'm sure there's a lot of kids that are calling you nerds and, you know, lots of other crazy things. Uh, so I just, you know, talk a little bit about that and thanks for giving me your day because this was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So um, for me, it was, it was always pretty clear that I enjoyed, like, learning and I enjoyed school and my dad, who's in the back, and he just popped up and said, hi. That's, that's Mr. Scott. And um, he uh, is an analytic geographer and my mom is a sociologist. You know, she says words like myopic and, <laughs> and fancy things. But I always felt like, I know, I just threw her under the bus, but she does it to me all the time. So it's fair. But I always, um, I always enjoyed learning. And I found that I was always the person who could express my feelings, and even if it was while I'm streaming down crying, or I didn't even, I felt like so angry, I just want to run and scream, I was able to say how I felt. And that was something that was able to translate to Amina and Tori, one of my earliest friends, and they can tell you their own personal stories. But I knew that I loved reading, and I, I knew that my parents were going to encourage me, because at one point I was a lacrosse player, I was a sneakerhead, I was a dancer, I was a singer, and they were like, you know, go Marley, you can do it. And it made me open. It made me always <coughs> notice, though, and they taught me to always see what you come back to. I always came back to reading. I always came back to being in my bed with a nice cup of tea, with a lot of sugar, which they get, I get in trouble for, but a lot of sugar, um, enjoying to read a book. And I felt like I always wanted to tell people about what I was writing or what I was speaking. And I talk a lot about that in the book. But I always felt as though there was a connection. And even though when um, it was really big, like I was watching Hannah Montana, I wanted to be a singer. 
I felt like reading was something that I could do for years and years and years of my long, you know, 13 years. I could do it for forever and forever. And I saw that and I recognized that and I felt as though everybody in my care circle was open to that. And I never felt shut. And that was something that I've learned through grassroots, it's something that I need to share with other black girls and other girls who are not part of the program, that it is not okay to let other people shun you for what you care about, and it's not okay to do that on, onto others, um, and to treat people with reciprocity, and to treat people with your own truth. So even though I always knew I loved reading, I felt as though whenever my idea would want to change, there were people always around me who would support me and be like, you know what, we're going to get you a microphone, we're going to get you a setup, you're going to try and do this, we're going to get you a, a studio, and you know, help you do whatever you want to do. Yeah. It's really important that I add that that person was not often me. Because <laughs> I think that I, there may be this misnomer, right? So Marley has a mom who has a PhD. But the person who recognized kind of Marley's love and understanding was actually Sonia. Because uh, Sonia's an American, and I'm not. Um, and she kept saying, the girl's bright. And I was like, you Americans. You're too hyperbolic. The girl's average. Right? And she was like, no, she is. I think she's bright. I was like, whatever, man. She can't read. She's like, no, can read. No, she can't. She understand. And then it turns out she can read. But, you know, but again, because it is a community, that's why when people forget the word community in our name, it's a community of people who come together to help us discover the brilliance and beauty of our children, to support them in ways. Grassroots and super camp, it is about the community. The community can save us, especially when we are not equipped at times. And that means you're tired, you're frustrated, you're busy, whatever the case may be, but the community holds your hand. Alright? So Ariane? So I'm a beginner at this, so um, <laughs> well you kind of have to, you have to know like, huh. well you have to see what you love, see what's a problem in the world, you have to see what's a problem with you, like what do you do wrong and what do you want to fix in the world. And you kind of have to like merge that together and try to see like how that can work and how you can make something big out of it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 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 Because a part of it is, I think what I hear in your question is, how do you even begin to see it? Right? So we're all here, but we don't all see these inequities. We don't all see the problem. So what about the training that you receive or the work of the Grassroots Community Foundation allows you to see things that others don't see? Okay, so with the Grassroots Community Foundation, I'm able to work with my community, which means that you don't just have to work with your neighbors, but with everybody that lives in the state or everybody who you think, even if they're, they don't suffer from major issues. Even just saying hello to somebody can brighten up their day. And um, we also, we have a lot of experiences. We go to museums, African American museums, not specifically this one, but all the time. And we also, every, say every, I think once a Saturday in a month, we used to go to a soup kitchen every month. And there's also the give, there's also give thanks and the turkey drive, which I think you should check out with those. And throughout the years, I've been able to understand what we've been doing with those things. So... I it's hard to articulate. Yeah. I would say that a Mom's part of the reason... Mom's laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> a part of, but I think, I think that this thing Tori hits on is that the girls have a lot of experiences. It's not one type of experience. So, Tori talks about you know, the fact that when they go to the soup kitchen, you can go to a soup kitchen, you can give out a jacket, you can donate, but they actually have to talk to a person. They have to understand the people there. Sometimes you used to have to write about the experience where they actually had to learn from a person. They learn because they're also learning African American history, they're learning sociology when they want, right? So they have this introduction to the economics of health, which is an understanding that poverty is not a cultural defect that poverty is simply the absence of money. That happens because the United States has decided that some people needed to be poor, right? It isn't that some people are not working. We know the poor work many hours. So they're learning all of those things 
really early at a time that some people have to go to college to learn that, right? And the, the myths that are often told to young people and are often told to the entire society, they're just not, they're not getting those myths. They're getting a truth about things. So why do I live here and they live there? Then they understand this because your mommy and daddy works hard. Actually, they may. But that's not the reason why you live here and they live there. I remember Marty once asking about like, how come we had snow removal and the other people did not? It isn't because we somehow are nicer, better people. It is because those people live in a community that is structured this way and the resources are organized this way. So our young girls, they're getting the answer to questions. The one, they have the space to ask the questions. And two, they're getting an answer that can make sense to them. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, I see now. So their eyes, their ability to see the problems, they're much more attuned to seeing social issues. And because they're trained to think anything that is, and yesterday I think uh, one of my colleagues said it, anything that's created can be recreated. Mm -hmm. So we've created poverty, we've promote racism and sexism. We can actually really undo these things. And so they come at the issue not just feeling overwhelmed by it, but feeling like they can chip away from where they sit. I think earlier on in your question, you were asking about passions and how we figured out our passions. Well, for me, passions were hard for me. I didn't know. I thought, oh, hi, Miss Aaron. <laughs> I, I saw, I tried a lot of different things and I tried to fit into every category, but nothing really fit in me. So it was really about asking the deeper questions. What do I really enjoy? Do I enjoy performing? Do I enjoy dancing or do I enjoy all of it? Do I like, like having a merge of like musicals, being able to dance, sing, act, and do everything in between? Do I like this or do I like that? It's about asking those questions and sort of like chipping deep and deeper until you can like find the root of what you love to do and what's your passion and then merging that with social action a problem you see in the world like Ariane was talking about and being able to merge those two into a social action project is really what we do and what it's about. Um, what um, are some of the things, or at least one of the things, that you ladies learned to unlock your confidence, that you kind of did every day to build that confidence? So I'm not like a dancer per se. I like to dance, and I, I think it's fun. And we were dancing earlier today at the training which you were at, and you all should participate in, which is Roots Rock Run for grassroots comes June-ish. Um, <laughs> A June-ish, it's like near Miss Lisa's birthday. It's yeah, exactly. it's June-ish. So um, I think for me it was dancing, and even though we have dancing, and it, there's some camps that are just specifically for dancing, what we do there, we have African dance. This year we have step, which I'm very excited about, kind of nervous about, very excited. Um, and to get to step and modern and contemporary, and even though I'm not necessarily, I'm not really the best dancer or, or very like, uh, excited to be, you know, this. But when I do it, I feel so much more confident. And in one way or another, like just today, when we were dancing and singing, I feel as though I have power in what I can do and power in my body. And also in the past, previous, in, the, in, in the current years, we've been able to have a doctor come and she's been able to talk to us about our growing bodies, but not in like a, uh, not in like a religious way where it's like, God did this and this and this, or you need to do this and this and this because this is a bad thing, this is a good thing, but just explain to us. And I think that even though I don't do that necessarily every day, getting to just look in the mirror and because I've had these previous experiences of recognizing that I am beautiful and that I am strong and that even though my shoulders are whack and whatever and I need to improve my posture, I can be you know, strong and confident and I can grow to get better at the things that I like to do. So I think dancing was one of the biggest things for me. And even though Amina is a fantastic dancer and Arya is a fantastic dancer, I feel like we all, in one way or another, and Tori, Tori's <laughs> situation, but, <laughs> but we all have, in one way or another, been able to feel like we can do something. So, I'm, so uh, uh, Tori, you, you can hit it. Context. So all girls have to dance, right? <laughs> and we chose dancing because dancing is about body confidence, right? That you recognize that your body 
is a tool and it can do things. We have a physician we'll work with, right, um, so that they get the scientific facts about their body. So what Martin's talking about is that, you know, some bodies are going to be shaped differently. Some things are going to grow, some are not gonna grow, some are gonna come at some later point. But you understand that this is just the fact of your body. This, and you do not have to feel any type of way about it. It is your body and each body's different. And so rather than having all of this kind of moralistic stuff around the body, it, this is the body and this is how it works. And the more you move it is the better you are for your health and you just feel comfortable in that body as it is. So we really merge those two things in ways that allow it to feel seamless. And Tori, who enjoys dancing, um, <laughs> has become a lot a much better dancer over the years. <laughs> much better dancer. Yeah, so Amina, what would you say helped you unlock your confidence? I gotta say affirmations. I do think affirmations, like saying daily I am, or I am truthful, or I am optimistic, like all those affirmations that we've had over the years. I think the first year we had a rock. Yes, they have yeah. to I still have that rock. I still have that rock of our affirmation, just like saying the affirmation daily and finding out what do I really want to work on and what am I going to become as these four weeks pass on and like how am I going to achieve this through truth, order, balance, and reciprocity and how is this going to change me? What do I want to do once I achieve this trait? And just like saying those affirmations has really helped me. So the girls set a goal at the beginning of camp of what they want to accomplish. The caregivers also set a goal of what they want their child to accomplish, right? And we develop a plan on really achieving that goal. And now because Super Camp is now the intensive beginning experience of a full year-round program, they have an opportunity to work on that now, not just in the four weeks, but the full year. So we meet twice a month um, for the entire year. So Super Camp is the entree point, the kind of intensive experience, and then it's twice a month for the entire year, so you have a chance to see the real growth, right? So each girl at the beginning of camp, the affirmation is the thing that you struggle with the most. So if you really struggle with being confident, you have to each time you introduce yourself at camp, you have to say, I am confident. And you keep saying that until that is the truth, right? Um, so that you begin to reframe the way that you think about it. Parents have to do it too. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, my name is Pamela Windham, and this is my niece, and we're from New York. So. <laughs> Did you go all the way from New York? Well, no. I planned okay. it. Really. Okay. We, right. right. She planned it for us okay. for when we came down here. And unfortunately, my niece would not be a part of your summer program. She's 12 years old, but she's involved in another program for the month of July, which is TEA program. I just wanted to know, do you all have anything in New York? And St. John's is my own neighborhood. <laughs> you know, I lived in the neighborhood, so. So we don't have anything in New York, so, but we are, don't be bummed out, right? Um, I have a set of students who insist that something must happen, and they have started to work on it on the side um, as a part of that process. So we're gonna take, no one should leave here without us getting all of your, is there a sign-in sheet that we have your contact information? Um, in order to make that happen. So we can at least send you follow-up information regarding this and that we can follow up to see. You can help us in developing what will happen next. Yes, she's very shy. Yes, please. <laughs> so I had two questions. One of the questions was, um, and I see that this seems to be very centered around young girls, young beautiful black girls to grow into beautiful older girls, women. Do you guys have anything that's geared to boys? Because I'm a mom of two boys. We do have a, a pilot that is being tested in New Jersey called the Super Boys Program. Okay. So it used to be a one week and then two week pilot that we developed and then there was a big hiatus because we wanted to have really men be in charge of that program. So this past year, we've had a set of super dads okay. who have really started to develop that program. So they are finalizing. So their program will end in June and then we'll have a, be able to look at the data and what they collected to see the iteration of that. Um, but it is our hope because we know that these young girls need to have friends, partners, 
right, co-workers who are going to be boys that can also um, exude the same confidence. So we're working on that. Please sign up for our newsletter where you can hear more about that because they will have an end of the year and their strategic learnings. Okay. Okay. And also, um, each one of the girls, when I came in, they were talking about um, the representation that they were getting in black history in their schools. And each one of these girls, I'm not sure what schools they go to or even if they are in Philadelphia. Um, and I find it really hard in school the same way about the representation of us and it being taught to us in a particular manner. And I find myself looking for schools, you know, that <coughs> cost lots of money. But when I get there, there's not a representation of what my children look like. And I don't want to spend, and I, and I said this when I went to visit uh, Germantown Friends, and I said, I don't want to spend $30,000 a year for my children to come here to them to possibly lose their identity mm -hmm. in this white Quaker school, mm -hmm. you know, because there wasn't a real big representation of African American art, studies, history. It was like a small portion, and I'm trying to figure out when do you guys actually bring that out? So how do you go about going to a school willing to possibly change your curriculum? This, so is, what, this is Tori too. This, this, is, so, so this is Tori. So you have three girls who go to public school. Tori used to go to a public school and now her she mom up. has bitten the bullet and gone someplace else. But I wanna answer the question a little bit about what it means. So they're in schools in New Jersey and I think that what, for all of you who have children in any schools, private or public schools, is that the United States has a challenge around African American history because it is, not, it, one, it's called African American history as opposed to US history. And so it, the, the absence of having a true understanding of how the United States came to be and the harsh reality of what the United States has done I think it's just gonna be a problem. So I think even the best schools are gonna be inadequate and therefore the responsibility is going to have to extend until we make some real efforts in the overall Department of Education. Because some schools will, will be better than others. They will say, you know, they will really dig into what has happened in terms of the enslavement, but the history is still being on really excavated at this point. We still, there's so much about our own history that we still only a few people know, mm -hmm. right? And so the work I think is ours um, as a community and I think as a caregiver of any child who has a contemporary US history, especially those coming out of the South, the, we're gonna have to continue to do that and to be in places and bring people to, to schools in ways that will help the, because the best intended folks still can't do it, okay. right? Um, and you know, I'm a public school advocate, and I, I, and I really think that if we use our collective energy by bringing, whether it is the people who have PhDs or are Temple or a Penn, and saying, look, I understand that you know, you're teaching this history. So and so professor would love to come in and do a session. Mm -hmm. That they would welcome that. Right, you have all of the African American History Department at Temple and at Penn and at Drexel. Those folks, caregivers can reach out to them. And I'll tell you, professors, we are often delighted to go talk to younger kids because college kids are. <laughs> so, yeah. So if you ask one of them, reach out and ask one of them to come to the school, they can help undo a lot of things in a very short period of time. And also, as professors, we got so much to say um, about history. Okay. Um, so, Tori, do you feel like you're getting a robust kind of African American history in your school? So Compared to what you got before? At my old school, majority of the school was Caucasians, and I wasn't really looked at, or if there was something with math, even if I got the top grades in the class, I wasn't going to be the one who the teacher recommended to go into the honors classes. So my mom, she brought me, well, my mom and my dad introduced me to private schools, which I go to one now, it's called Morristown Baird. And although it's not the most diverse school that you know, that you might see, or there's still probably not as many African Americans as you might see at Marley and Amina School, or Arion School, I still think, like last month, me and a couple of my friends, we noticed that there wasn't African American, there wasn't a Black History Month, um, at our school, me, at our, 
like we have school meetings every Wednesday and we wanted to introduce that to our school. So we actually, for four weeks, we brought this to some of the heads of the school in the morning meeting and we told them that we didn't feel like this was being represented and they accepted what we, um, they agreed with what we said and they allowed us to present at morning meeting and we got to talk about some of the influential leaders and the arts and entertainment. So we have five more minutes, so we can take two questions at most. Anybody have any questions? Well, I, I'm, I'm very curious. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw two out. You can answer whatever you want. Okay. So one, uh, Marley, specifically, just to empower other people, that you wrote a book. What was your process in terms of getting your ideas together, structuring, outlining, and all that? And then also, what, what media, um, how do you feel about today's representation of black girls in media? So I really like the second question, and a lot of people don't ask me about this, because they know that just assume I just like books, I don't like engage in any other thing, which is not true. I mean, I have my phone right here. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that the representation in the media is really important, and even though I was just having this talk about um, the enslavement of Africans, having that not just be a topic that we focus on during Black History Month or African American History Month, um, but making sure that the narratives of the Harlem Renaissance and of the 1970s and 80s and also just at the beginning of the beginning of time where even when people were enslaved, they were doing things to help the country that we aren't recognizing. And we are considering them, you know, these, and Black History Month, we're going to focus on black inventions, black creations, black this, but March 1st doesn't even matter anymore. And this information is not being asked to be retained by students, and it's also not being represented immediately after. And I feel like for me as a young black girl, I have been lucky to not experience um, any sexualization of me personally, but I know that like if that were to happen, my mom and my dad would be you know ready to go. <laughs> but that's not the case for most black girls. And they, a lot of the times they see with popular celebrities or popular TV shows that they either have to be really ratchet or they have to be angry. And that's not the case for most black girls. And the reason that they are angry is because my teacher just said that Africa was a country. It's because my teacher just said that I was three-fourths, I was three-fifths of a human and my great-great-great-great-grandfather didn't even matter. Like it's these little things that they say and then we're put into a situation and I was actually just talking about this with Amina. We're put into a situation where we're like, why can't we just be vulnerable? Why can't we just share our emotions? And I think the media, in a sense, contributes to that, but also has a really beautiful side that I am working to show to students and to show to teachers and community members. So my campaign is, is used through social media, and I try to also not necessarily say that your ideas are bad, but to say that I have my own and that we can use these ideas, and even the unique ones where Ariane has Zen Zone, and you have Full Court Dress, and you have Math Wiz, and we can all bring them together to show to people that black girls have a capability that is beyond belief of every single person that I've ever gotten to speak to. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you all for your time. Um, I say that if you are going to linger for a little bit, Marty's going to go upstairs and sign some books and we're going to take some photos, is that the people in the room that I've identified, Lisa Maxwell, Ali Scott, which I, who I saw over there, she's going to take your information. You have Tanisha Malcolm, Patrice Barnett, Sonia Fergus, is that really you talk about the role of the caregivers. The caregivers have a tremendous commitment. So we ask, the girls have physical activity requirement. They have to do at least four hours of physical activity outside of their usual school gym. So do the caregivers. The girls have to do community service for up to 40 hours over the years. Their caregivers have to participate in it. So unlike other places where it is do as I say, this work is really about modeling. So we have to be the things that we want our children to be. The aunties have to participate. <laughs> The Sugar Pledge. So in Can we talk about it? <laughs> Tori, would you like to talk about wow. the Sugar Pledge? Wow. Wow. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Tori's going to do the exact So I really enjoy physical activity. I also enjoy telling the truth, balance, and I sometimes can be a health nut. So during the Sugar Pledge, it's basically over the course of camp and hopefully for the rest of your life. Um, you try to say each day, try to say, or I think what you, uh, yeah, under 18 grams of sugar. Well, 
artificial sugar. You can still have natural sugar, which I think it tastes better. Um, but, yeah. So you take the sugar pledge. Marley, would you like to add a few words about the sugar pledge? Oh, I thank you. Um, <laughs> We can't have like fried foods, and for me, generally, like the first week, everyone's like, Yeah, excited to go, healthy, new, new summer, new me, whatever. And then the second week, it's like flat, like you don't even know what's happening. But in a sense, but in a sense, it helps like a lot for us as leaves because we have acne, we feel like this way, we don't feel confident, we don't feel like we're we have energy to do anything, and sometimes it's just like our psychologically, but also physically. So, um, uh, and again, with like kind of the doctor as well, we get to learn about how we can use, um, have a healthy, balanced meal, and also create them for breakfast and for, and for lunch and for dinner. And I know some kids at my school who haven't eaten breakfast since they were like four because their moms and their dads don't eat breakfast. So we also want to show that to the parents that they need to create an example that we don't, we don't need to have cotton candy every single time that it's every single time you have something good that's happening, but we can make our own smoothies. We can go out and not have soda. And I think Tori can at least say that her mom really, really, really liked soda. So now she likes sparkling water, but it was like, it was something that we all had to be a part of. And we all had to make sure that it wasn't just like bad, 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 don't drink this, but we had to do that as well. So I actually enjoy it more every year, but it was really tough at the beginning for everybody because we didn't know what we didn't know what we were getting into. We were like, it's easy, but it wasn't. Back it's in the really captain important. I mean, as I talked to you about at the very beginning to bring it um, to a closing is that our wellness is not simply about one part of us. Marty's campaign comes out of a public health and social action organization because literacy is important for a whole host of things that improve our health and well-being and that we need to begin to think of ourselves as full human beings that pay attention to not only what we put in and not, the put in is both about the food but the information that we put in. How do we digest this information? How will we take it in? And so what we are asking or trying to develop with grassroots is for community people who understand that we are stronger together and that we can be healthy together. We can reimagine remodel and redo all of these things that have happened. And that, that can happen especially when we plant, right, seeds and when we let them grow and then when we invest in girls that they offer us this possibility of coming together. So we thank you for your time, we appreciate your energy and happy Saturday. <laughs>